<clears throat> okay, so last time we, um, sorry, where did we go? Okay, so last time we uh, started talking the, about the idea of um, Bayesian statistic. So what we can do is uh, we can put a prior on um, the parameter. So we used to have a parameter that uh, we treated as non-random. In the Bayesian framework, you, you treat the parameter as random and you can think of the, these distributions, um, the parametric family as uh, giving you conditional distributions of your data, X given theta. Um, so together with, with, with the prior, um, these conditional distributions define a joint distribution on X and theta. And so we can um, uh, talk about um, their joint behavior, basically. So we saw last time that we can define this so-called Bayes risk, um, which, which you can view as either the expected uh, frequentest risk uh, when you plug in theta um, uh, or, or take the expectation respect to the um, distribution, prior distribution of theta, or you can think of this as directly as the loss uh, when you take the expectation both on um, under the joint, basically under the joint distribution of theta and x. So um, if you view it in this uh, fashion, this would be just the weighted average of the risk function, the frequentist risk function. And in that sense, uh, it gives you a reduction which it, then you can use to, to compare different estimators, okay? Um, if you, um, so if, if you recall, last time we um, discussed um, the idea that we can minimize this so-called Bayes risk. So this was, um, basically the expectation of the loss um, over theta and delta x. And so I can, I can minimize uh, this loss, so the expected loss. And um, the, the, the solution, which is, which is called the Bayes rule, uh, and this lambda here is just the prior. So theta is distributed like lambda uh, prior on theta. So the solution uh, under some mild conditions, um, which are stated here, that there exists at least one um, estimator whose base risk is finite. And um, this um, quantity is well-defined um, for mu almost uh, all x. So if I um, take basically this estimator, which minimizes for every uh, x the posterior loss, expect posterior expected loss, uh, then the idea is that we showed last time that that, that would be the Bayes rule. Um, so the distribution, um, the distribution theta given x equal x, uh, or something like this, let's say. This conditional distribution x given theta is called the posterior distribution of theta. Distribution of theta. And this is the object of interest in Bayesian statistics. So in Bayesian statistics, you specify the distribution of x given theta. Uh, sometimes this is called, so, We specify um, x given theta. Sometimes um, so this would be p theta, let's say. Um, and we can write it like this. Um, sometimes this is referred to as the likelihood, and, and then, then we have the prior. So likelihood together with the prior. Um, specifies the model, and then you want to invert this. Instead of this, you're interested in theta given x, and you can use the Bayes rule to actually compute this. And I hope people, most, most of the people know about this. Um, so I'm going to talk about this um, 
in, in, in a couple of examples or, or down in the next slide, basically. But once you have this distribution, you, in, in principle, will be able to compute the, 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 the base rule, which is the minimizer of um, posterior risk or expected uh, or posterior expected loss, something like this. Okay, was that clear from last time? Uh, maybe let me continue a little bit and then ask, ask that question again. So, uh, so the idea here is uh, in the, the Bayesian framework, you, you have this likelihood, which is, in this case, we were presenting it as a um, density. So P X given theta, I mentioned if you view it as a function of theta, that's the likelihood and then multiplied by uh, the prior and then divided by, this is the marginal distribution of X, uh, which is just the integral of uh, the numerator there over theta. So this is nothing but the Bayes rule. So this is the posterior of theta given X can be written as uh, the probability of X given theta basically. In this case, this is replaced with the density um, times the probability of theta divided by the probability of X. So um, in this case, these are all, let's say densities, um, but that's, that's the form of the Bayes rule in this case. And you can see that as a function of theta, this is gonna be proportional to the product of the likelihood times the prior. Okay, so that's the um, general idea that as long as you um, care about the posterior, the shape of the posterior is the likelihood times the prior. Um, and uh, oftentimes you don't need to necessarily know uh, this explicitly, and sometimes you can infer it, uh, but, but basically this is the normalizing constant. So, um, for a given x, this is going to be a constant as a function of theta. So that division by the marginal likelihood is, or by the marginal, sorry, marginal distribution is um, um, the, the act of normalizing the posterior. Um, so sometimes you recognize, we'll see examples, you recognize that this, once you multiply this, you recognize the form of the density, and so you already know the normalizing factor, so you don't need to compute the marginal distribution necessary. Um, okay, so if you wanna translate that result to concrete cases, we can consider the common case of the quadratic loss. That would be, let's say our loss function. Uh, here I'm um, defining the loss with respect to some um, function of the parameter, so G theta. And so what we, um, um, our result is telling us is that the Bayes rule can be written like this. So this would be uh, actually not the minimum, but the argument um, of this quantity. So that's the expected loss, uh, but I'm taking the expectation under the posterior uh, of theta given X. So I'm looking at this conditional expectation base. So you look at this conditional expectation uh, and you try to minimize it over A um, and I let you do this for yourself, it turns out that the solution is just the um, conditional expectation of G theta given X. Um, and um, you can, I mean, you can ignore basically this conditioning. You can do it with unconditionally. If you do it unconditionally, you get the expectation of G theta. And whatever you get conditionally, you can just add the conditioning here because um, that um, conditioning is just a new distribution. So instead of um, computing it over the, um, the conditional distribution, you can compute it for a general distribution on theta and then restrict it or specialize it to the case of conditional um, distribution. So the computation of the Bayes um, uh, rule basically reduces to figuring out what is the argument of something like this for a general distribution on theta. So if you understood what I mentioned, this sometimes simplifies your life because at this addition of this seems to complicate thing, but complicate thing, but it doesn't actually. So it's just um, as long as you understand uh, what, what this problem does, um, so the solution of this would be a um, feature of the distribution of data, 
whatever that feature is, you can apply that feature to the conditional distribution. So if I do it with the quadratic loss here, um, that would be argmin expectation theta, let's say minus a squared, and the solution of this would be just the expectation of theta. So this is saying that for quadratic loss, this uh, optimization, the result is the mean of the distribution of theta. So if I apply it to the conditional distribution of theta, it would be the mean of the conditional distribution, which would be this, or in this case, g theta, conditional mean of g theta, and so on. Okay. And um, if you replace this uh, quadratic loss with the L1 loss, um, then you can argue that you get a conditional median. Um, and the median is not unique, so any median would work. And this is an example where the Bayes rule is not unique. So you, you could have multiple Bayes rule, uh, depending on. Um, so if the distribution is continuous, probably not, but uh, in, for discrete distributions, this median might be um, multi-valued. So you could have multiple Bayes rules. OK, any questions? All good. So it's easier to solve this problem instead in general. So think a little bit about this for yourself. Um, this sometimes simplifies the notation and there's nothing lost, you do it this way. Okay, no questions? So one of the interesting things that you can try is to change these losses. Uh, I'll give you examples in um, homework problems. So for example, you can change it to the zero one loss um, and the solution changes, you'd get the mode of the distribution instead. If you change it to some other loss, um, you get a different thing. So all of them would be characteristics of the posterior. So instead of the mean of the posterior or the median of the posterior, you might get the mode of the posterior or some other um, functional of the posterior. Okay, so, so here's back to so our basic example, suppose I have an X, which is binomial zero, sorry, binomial N and theta. <clears throat> this is like a model for a coin tossing example. So you have tossed the coin N times and recorded um, the number of heads and uh, the probability of uh, heads is theta. So we're trying to estimate theta. Probability mass function can be written like this, hopefully everyone. Uh, is comfortable with that by now. Uh, and if you view it as a function of theta, this would be the likelihood as well. Um, so the natural, or let's say, uh, formal statement is conjugate. So we'll talk about that. Conjugate prior for theta in this case is a beta distribution. And a beta distribution has two hyper, so-called hyperparameters. So the parameters of the prior are called hyperparameters. So you have these hyperparameters alpha and beta um, that define the um, prior. Um, so for calculations, um, you only care about mostly about the um, shape or up to a constant. So up to a constant, this looks like this and up to a constant, the likelihood looks like this. And you can see as a function of theta, they, they look very similar. Okay, and that's, that's the conjugacy idea. So, uh, the posterior would be product of the likelihood times the posterior proportional to this. And so if I multiply this one by this one, you can see the um, exponents sort of add up uh, and I get that expression. Okay, so the posterior would be proportional to this. Um, and then here I'm claiming that this is a beta distribution. Okay, um, I'm claiming that this is the posterior is a beta distribution with these parameters. So anyone can maybe um, argue how, um, 
uh, my claim is like okay or is it not okay? How am I saying something like this? Uh, well, if you just uh, take the p of x given theta and then you multiply it with the uh, pi of theta, yeah. like the, yeah, the exponents will combine. Yes, so that, that has happened. So I get this. So now why can we claim that this is a beta distribution? So that's the form of the density of the posterior. But I, I only know it up to a constant, right? I don't know the exact distribution at this point. How do we claim that this is a beta? Uh, that's a canon of a beta distribution. That's right. Theta. Can you say that again? Uh, it's the kernel of a better distribution with regards to when we look at theta, theta in this case being the random variable and therefore the product becomes a kernel of a better distribution. Um, okay, yeah, so that, uh, so you're saying the kernel of a beta, right? So, okay, yeah, th this is, um, so if you compare with this, this is a, the form of a general beta distribution. And let's say the, um, the part that matters is this part. So up to a constant, the beta, so you can think of the beta distribution as being proportional to something like that. And we compare these to that. And you can see that this is alpha is replaced with this and beta is replaced with that. So this just shows that this is a beta distribution. And the normalizing constant is just gonna come and, and normalize this. Um, so by just comparing the form to this, because this is up to a, a constant, exactly something similar to a beta um, density, this has to be a beta distribution with these parameters. Okay, and so um, that's how you compute or, or calculate the, the posterior. You can see you don't need to integrate or deal with these gamma functions at this point. Um, I'm just recognizing the form and that's enough. So if you want, you can also compute the normalizing factor by, by just recalling what the normalizing factor of the beta is. But if you understand this, a lot of the times you can recognize the form of the density, at least in, in basic applications, not necessarily in practice, but um, if you're, you have conjugate priors um, and the conjugate prior basically has this meaning that once you multiply it by the likelihood, the posterior remains in the same family. So this prior, which is the beta prior is conjugate to the binomial likelihood in the sense that the prior is in the, if, if the prior is beta, then the posterior is gonna be also beta. The posterior remains in the same family. Uh, okay, so I have a beta. And so if I ask what is the um, Bayes rule with respect to the quadratic loss, that would be, uh, let's say I'm, I'm taking G theta to be just identity. So I'm, I'm looking at the loss theta minus a. Uh, so that would be the Bayes uh, rule. So the Bayes rule is the expectation of the posterior. Um, and so it would be this the expectation of this distribution. And the expectation of the beta is just um, this parameter divided by the sum of the two parameters, which would be this. So that gives you the Bayes rule and you can see this is just a function of X, it's a valid estimator. So X goes in and this estimate of theta comes up. Um, and you can rewrite this in, in this fashion. So X over N, alpha over alpha plus beta, and then you get a um, sort of convex combination. So lambda is between zero and one, lambda is given here. Um, and you can uh, see that your, your Bayes estimator is a convex combination of two, um, let's say other estimators. Um, one is X over N, which is the MLE or the unbiased estimator of the mean parameter here. So the natural estimator of theta here is um, theta at equal X over N. Um, this is the MLE. Um, 
say data at NLE. Uh, and this is the prior mean. The mean of the prior is another estimator, but it's the constant estimator. So this is the mean of this beta distribution. So you can see that the Bayes rule takes an average, a weighted average or a convex combination of these two estimators. So if lambda is very small, so the prior mean has little effect and most of the uh, weight is put on the MLE. So the Bayes uh, rule will be very close to the MLE. On the other hand, if uh, lambda is very close to one, um, you're gonna have a, a lot of uh, uh, weight put on the prior mean. So you, um, let's say, um, trust the prior mean much more than your data in that case. So the Bayes rule would be more, um, um, let's say biased towards the prior mean or takes that into more consideration. Um, and this lambda, as you can see, is related naturally to the, the sample size. So as the sample size goes to infinity, the lambda goes to zero. And so this term goes away and you, you converge to the MLE. You get more and more data, the effect of the prior goes down. Um, so this goes to zero. Uh, and the Bayes rule is um, progressively determined more and more by the data alone. Um, on the other hand, if the sample size is very small, you can see that lambda is much closer to one and so the prior takes, takes effect. So for a small sample size, you're more inclined to um, output the prior mean as your estimate uh, or, or put more weights on it. Uh, if you have zero sample size, basically, and is zero, you would just output the prior mean. If you have a tiny bit like one, there's a little bit of, um, uh, this would be slightly less than one. So there's a, some weight here, but it would be small. So as you gather more and more samples, let's say 10, you put more weights here and so on. So you can see there's a natural, the base sort of uh, rule naturally balances your evidence from data and your prior belief. And for this reason, uh, a lot of people like this uh, because it gives you some way of um, combining your prior knowledge uh, with um, the um, new evidence. So for example, this, um, you, can, you can think of this as you, you, uh, if, if you have done this, um, because the, the posterior is a beta, you can think of this as a prior for the next experiment. So you've done, you've done this experiment once and you get these. These now are gonna be like alpha prime and beta prime. Now this is your current posterior it could be your prior for your next experiment. So this is your current uh, belief about well, your theta. Next time you uh, wanna try the experiment, you might not wanna start from the scratch. You might use this as your prior. So that would be alpha prime, beta prime. And now you have more data and you keep adding it to your uh, prior belief. So for this reason, um, some people might like this idea and you can think of this uh, reasoning as the natural way that you reason about the world as well. So there's a lot of philosophical issues here that you can get yourself into. Um, that's how you sort of update. So you have some prior belief that probably at some point uh, are formed by previous evidence. Um, and now you get new evidence, you, you update your prior uh, belief about the world, and this becomes your new prior. And, and then you move forward and, and get it as you get it more and more expert, like evidence, you, you keep updating, and this is like a continuous pro like a process. Um, your posteriors become priors, and then, uh, uh, and then in turn, they transform into new prior posteriors, and so on. Okay. Questions, comments about this? Uh, quick question. You might have mentioned this and I missed it, but at the bottom it says this happens in a general exponential family. Uh, uh, yes. Is that, is that on the prior or the, the like uh, data? Uh, I, I'm talking about this uh, decomposition into the MLE. And so the convex combination idea. Um, 
that was what I was referring to. So if you do a conjugate prior. Okay. And I think we will see an exa another example yeah, shortly in the normal. That, that's what, what it sort of happens in, in the exponential bound. So if you do the conjugate prior, um, your, your, your base like estimate under quadratic loss would, would, would behave like this. Thank you. No problem. Other questions? Uh, hi, Professor. Can you hi. quickly go back to the uh, example four? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so uh, I st uh, still um, not very clear why uh, the arc mean. Uh, oh, it's a uh, arc mean of g uh, theta. Okay. So okay, now I understand. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. Got resolved itself. Okay. Yeah. Question. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay. So let's do another example. Here's another example. We have, um, this is your, our usual location family. So XIs are uh, IID draws given theta equal theta uh, from a normal distribution with mean theta and variance sigma squared. Here we are assuming the sigma squared is known. Um, and then I'm gonna put another prior on theta uh, or a prior on theta, which is gonna be another normal distribution. So I'm gonna assume that Theta follows a normal distribution with mean mu and uh, variance p squared. So these are the hyperparameters. These are the pra parameters of the prior. Uh, and at, at this point, you assume that you know these. These are coming from your prior information. Um, and then uh, I'll um, let you guys verify this next statement that this part of the model is equivalently written as this. So because it's a location family, I can, um, once you subtract theta, things would become um, centered. Uh, so I can write uh, the model equivalently as uh, xi is equal to theta plus wi, where these two pieces are independent. And wi is iid, which means zero and variance sigma squared. Um, and then I also have that, um, theta is. So this is the likelihood part and also have that theta is distributed like uh, normal to be mu and variance p squared. So these two pieces of information give, allows me to compute the posterior. So there are different ways to approach this. So you can um, go ahead like this, write down the likelihood, um, the likelihood from this part and then multiply it by the prior ignore the constants and you recognize that as a uh, Gaussian. So the posterior would be another normal uh, distribution and then you try to figure out the mean and the variance. Um, another way to see it is that uh, this vector is gonna be um, jointly Gaussian because, um, because theta, you can think of the theta um, me do it here. So, okay, did not work. So let's go here. Um, that's fine, I think. Yeah, so what you can do is it show that or theta w1, wn. Uh, these would be jointly Gaussian, okay? So the joint distribution would be normal, which mean um, the mean of theta would be mu. These are gonna have zero mean. And then the variance would be, um, for the be uh, yeah, for the theta would be b squared, for the other guys would be sigma squared, and they're gonna be independent, so this would be zero here. So that's one giant uh, multivariate normal distribution. And then you can write um, uh, theta and then x1 up to xn as a matrix times um, theta uh, w1 up to wn. So this is a linear transformation of a jointly Gaussian variable. So matrix. Um, 
equivalently a linear transform. So linear transformation preserve Gaussianity. Okay. So joint Gaussianity. So things are jointly Gaussian uh, before and then after they're going to be jointly Gaussian. And um, then you can compute the entire covariance matrix. So the expectation of this guy uh, would be the A times the expectation of the other one. Um, and then the covariance of that guy would be A times covariance at A transpose. So you can compute the entire um, distribution this way. Uh, you don't need the entire co covariance structure of this, but uh, it gives you the variance of basically uh, theta. Uh, moreover, the conditional distribution, so theta given x1 up to xn, uh, this also, actually you need the covariance. Um, this is gonna be normal. Um, and then you can figure out the distribution by from, from this information once you have the covariance of the, um, and the mean of the joint distribution, you can compute the conditional distributions. There are formulas for that. Um, so I encourage you to, if you, if you don't know about them, read, read about it. So Wikipedia page for the normal distribution. Media for multivariate normal distribution. So that's the like a simple way. If if you go through the, the this idea, this is actually how you could prove those conditional statements. The fact that the conditional distributions are um, on their joint um, Gaussian distributions are Gaussian um, has been calculated like that. Let's say you can prove it that way, or you can use that result. In any case, this turns out to be a normal distribution with a certain mean and a certain variance. Uh, here, we're writing the variance in terms of the precision, uh, precisions, which are the um, inverse of the variance. So the, this is the prior precision, which is one over the variance of the prior. And this is the, um, let's say, likelihood, or you know, it's referred to the like, it's not likelihood, but this guy, the conditional distribution, the precision of that. Um, and so the precision of the posterior would be um, n times the, I would say, likelihood precision plus the precision of the um, prior. So the precisions add up. Uh, and the more you have the sample size, the bigger the sample size, the larger the precision linearly like increases with the uh, sample size. So the, the, the larger the precision, the smaller the variance. And then you can see the mean, uh, mean of the posterior, which is, which is also the Bayes rule, uh, is a weighted combination of X bar, uh, which is the, um, um, the MLE in this case, and, and mu, which is the mean of the um, prior. Uh, so you'd have that nice convex combination. And this lambda here, again, in zero one, um, has a nice uh, expression as the ratio of the precision of the prior to the precision of the posterior. So the more um, precise your posterior gets, the smaller this becomes. And so your weight shifts towards the um, uh, MLE. And, and this happens if your sample size grows um, or the precision of the likelihood or the data part basically goes up. Either lambda goes up, or gamma goes up, or n goes up. Um, or uh, another way that this goes, could go up is that um, the, um, yeah, so that, that's the way that it goes up. If, if tau goes up, the precision of the um, prior, then you can see that the lambda converges to one, so you keep um, a lot of weights near near mu. Um, so this, uh, again, uh, it's it's work for for you guys to um, try to uh, understand this this trade off. It's it's a very nice trade off. Uh, so here, it's, it's summary is that if n goes to infinity or the SNR in this case the um, 
precision of the likelihood or the data part divided by the precision of the prior goes to infinity, then um, the Bayes rule converges to the MLE um, and, and the opposite direction when the precision goes, like the SNR goes to zero, um, this goes, um, the Bayes rule converges to mu. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um, no questions. Uh, is there a reason we reparameterize to precision instead of variance? Like, it doesn't seem like anything changes. Like, you just kind of flip everything around. Uh, yeah, but the, 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 it's not a, um, uh, for this problem, it's not necessarily that. Um, different, but it's a little bit um, cleaner because the precisions add up. So you can think of this as, um, there's a lot of intuition behind this. So each, each data point, so you can think of this as gamma squared plus gamma squared plus gamma squared n times plus tau squared. So each sample point adds one uh, unit of gamma squared to your posterior precision. In, in this way, the precisions add up naturally. So the precision of the prior plus the precision of each data point. Um, for the variance, it's not like that. So the precisions in this case add up. The variance is like the inverse of it. It doesn't have that in, like nice information. I see, thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, and then sometimes the precision is easier. So if you want, let's say, I, you could also think of the, um, um, there's a lot of discussion in the, Bayesian approach, one of the difficulties um, of Bayesian uh, approach is, is coming up with this prior, even if you've come up with the form, coming up with the um, hyperparameters is challenging. So um, ideally you have some prior information. You try to fit, let's say, uh, this to your prior information, figure out mu and b squared. But if you don't uh, actually have that, and then you'd have some sort of an issue of how to choose these. And you have to like come up with this like by an ad hoc or random way. Or you could also come up with other priors on this. So you could put priors on this and this as well. And this leads to the idea of hierarchical Bayesian modeling. So um, you have high parameters, you don't know about them. So you put priors on them and then they have probably they have high parameters and you keep adding, uh, stacking up these priors on top of each other. And at some point you stop, but um, the, the more you go up, uh, um, the, the, the probably the less um, the prior would have effect on, on your uh, inference. So um, if I change this B, I might have uh, some effect on the posterior, but if I put a prior on it and change the hyperparameters of that, probably the effect would be this, um, uh, less or subdued. Um, and then for putting priors, it's easier to put priors on the uh, precision. So if you think about this, um, um, there are, um, so you, you could come up with um, priors on this such that um, the posterior looks nice. Um, so for example, you can put a gamma prior on this, whereas on the variance, you have to do an inverse gamma. Um, in any case, so you get, you get a sense once you work with these models a little bit, um, sometimes it's easier to work with parameters in terms of the precision. But in this problem, the natural, the idea is that the precisions naturally add up. And um, that was the main reason. Other questions? So no questions? Seems like everything is fine. Okay, so if not, let's go. Um, Let's go to this um, slide. So we already discussed this. The idea of conjugacy is that you can come up with prior families. So a family of priors um, is conjugate to a family of likelihoods. Um, if the corresponding posteriors le don't leave the, the, the family of the prior, so still belong to the same family. So for example, we have seen that if you have a normal um, prior and if you have a normal likelihood, uh, then they're conjugate. So the posterior would be normal. If you have a beta prior and a binomial likelihood, then um, you'd have a con conjugate um, pair. 
because the posterior would be in, in the same family as beta. Um, the extension would be multinomial like here and Drishle. So Drishle is um, uh, like the multivariate version of the beta. So it's a probability distribution on, um, on probability vectors, basically. Discrete probability measures, basically. Uh, and so uh, multinomial is an extension of the binomial. So these are also conjugate pairs. And in any exponential family, you can, um, so this is the likelihood, so the, the density, um, if you view it as a function of theta, it's the likelihood, and you can come up with a conjugate pair, like a prior, uh, by, by uh, sort of mimicking this part. Um, and so you want something which is um, A times this, uh, and then you'd add like a constant here times uh, A theta, and then there's this normalizing constant. So the way, um, to think about it is that if you multiply these two, uh, you can see that uh, you get a plus t of x, uh, eta theta, and then plus uh, b uh, minus one a theta. Uh, so the the posterior would be proportional to this, and you can see the shape, the the form of the posterior is the same as the prior. Uh, you just updated this h to this parameter, and you updated your b. Uh, to this parameter. So that would be the posterior. So this gives you a conjugate uh, prior for any um, exponential family. It might not be necessarily um, a um, well-known distribution. In some cases it, it is, but in general it might not be um, well-known and it might not be easy to integrate out. So you might have difficulty figuring out this, um, but it's just um, the way it is, okay? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what do you mean by, what do you mean by saying that you, it's hard to uh, to measure B, so B minus one, right? It's already given in the... Uh, no, I was talking about this, this one. The, normalizing constant. So if you want to have a proper density, you have to be able to integrate this. So you have to figure this out. Um, in, in most common distributions, you already know this. For the Gaussian, for example, you know the normalizing constant. For the beta, you know, you know it. Um, for this family, it might not be in general easy to compute. You have to integrate this part. Right, right. Uh, and, and so that capital B, that was like what I was referring to. So okay. this is up to a normalizing constant, but mm -hmm. the normalizing constant might not be easy to come by. So depending on your application, if you need the normalizing constant, this may or may not be um, a reasonable prior, okay? Mm -hmm. Other issues, comments? Okay, so um, another piece of information is that sometimes, um, well, let's say, let's, let's start with this question. So in the normal example that we just did, um, one question is that, is there a Bayes estimator that, um, or let's say, is, is this MLE a Bayes estimator or a Bayes rule with respect to some prior? So if I change the, um, so this was the, uh, Bayes uh, rule, uh, and the Bayes rule depends on, on the prior. So this is the Bayes rule with respect to this prior. If I change the prior, um, uh, I get a different Bayes rule. And in fact, you can see if I change the values of these, the Bayes rule will change. Um, lambda will change here. And I can, I can change this entire distribution to something else, I get a different Bayes rule. Uh, one question that you can ask is, is there a prior that I can put on theta such that this phase rule is exactly x bar. So can I recover the MLE as um, a Bayes rule or a Bayes estimator under some um, prior? And, and the answer is that not with, with so-called prior, proper priors. Proper priors are all the priors that we discussed so far. They're finite measures, so they integrate to one. So in particular, they integrate to something less than infinity. Um, and if you restrict yourself to this class, um, class of proper priors, uh, then the answer would be no. What you can uh, see um, 
if you think about it, uh, what you would need is a prior which is uniform on the entire real line, um, sort of the Lebesgue measure, um, but, but that's not a, a proper prior because it doesn't normalize to something finite. So the um, measure of the whole real line is uh, infinite under the Lebesgue measure. Uh, so this leads to the idea of improper priors. Um, so you can think of the Lebesgue measure or the uniform distribution on, on, on the entire real line as um, so a prior that just is, is one, let's say, or proportional to one for all theta in R. So that's a, an impro improper prior in the sense that it, it's, it's, it's a non-negative function, um, but it does not integrate to something finite. However, uh, the posterior turns out to integrate to something finite. So you, you're, 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 you usually think about improper priors in the case where uh, the posterior is well-defined. So you can come up with something which is itself not a probability distribution, um, but the posterior is a well-defined probability distribution. And these are called generalized Bayes um, rules or the general, general, generalized Bayes estimators. And if you, if you work in that class, then yes, there is a generalized Bayes estimators. An alternative approach is to think of this as limits of proper Bayes rules. And you already have seen this in, in both of these cases. So in both of these cases, um, this is a proper Bayes rule. And in the limit, let's say as tau, tau goes to, um, let's say um, zero, um, this lambda goes to zero. And um, so your um, Bayes rule approaches the MLE and the same goes for the binomial example. So you can, you can obtain the MLE as a limit of proper Bayes rules or as a Bayes rule with improper uh, prior. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit of that. Questions, comments? Okay, so this is a little bit about the uniqueness of the Bayes estimator from the zero point estimation. I'm gonna skip over this um, you're welcome to take a look and also take a look at the corresponding theorem in um, the um, uh, Lehman's book, Casella and Lehman. So the, um, the idea is that in general, the Bayes rule is not um, unique, but this theorem gives you some conditions under which you can, you can expect the unique Bayes estimator or Bayes rule. Okay, so now let's move on. So that's, that's our brief introduction to Bayesian statistics. Um, the, the, the recap, um, in, in the Bayesian approach, you put a, a distribution on, on your parameter, which is called the prior, and then you try to um, inverse, invert the relation between x and theta. So you know the distribution of x conditional on theta, and you know the distribution of theta, and now you try to find the distribution of theta given x. Um, and uh, this is called the posterior, and this sort of encodes all the information that the Bayesian would be interested in. And computing the posterior in general is not easy. In these simple examples that we did uh, using conjugate priors, oftentimes the posterior is um, straightforward. You know the form and, and basically the problem is done. The more complicated setups, um, especially in higher dimensions, the you get a joint distribution for the posterior, which is not easy to write down. So you'd resort into um, numerical approaches. So you, if you have heard about MCMC approaches, Gibbs sampling, Markov chain, Monte Carlo approaches, uh, these are the approaches that you use to try to sample from the posterior. So the posterior is not tractable, uh, but you can try to de devise, um, let's say Markov chains that whose invariant distribution, whose stationary distribution is your posterior. And then you try to sample from the posterior by running that those um, chains. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. That's sort of the, the, the requires a whole other course um, and, and some other courses that people talk about those. Um, but you're talking about here about the um, like theoretical properties. Um, and um, from a frequentist perspective, the Bayesian approach is re reduced to the idea that we assign a weight to each of our parameter uh, values, and then we look at the weighted risk. 
So the Bayes risk is basically the weighted risk. Um, and this defines a Bayes uh, risk. And there is an optimal, uh, not necessarily an optimal, but yeah, there is at least one optimal Bayes rule, sometimes a unique, sometimes not. Uh, but um, you could find an estimator that dominates everyone else. Um, Generally, so you can find an estimator that whose Bayes risk is the smallest, and this is called the Bayes rule. And from a frequency perspective, that would be the end of this story. So you put a prior, uh, you put a weight on your space, theta space, and then you'd have a unique um, best estimator. So you'd have like optimality in the sense of Bayes. Um, the other approach that we discussed now, we can talk about it. Um, instead of averaging, you can look at the maximum risk. So you're back in the frequentist um, setup where we don't think of theta as random. Um, rather, we take the maximum or supremum over the risk function, over theta of the risk function. OK. Um, so is the setup clear? So now we want to talk a little bit about the uh, minimax criteria. So we want to minimize this maximum risk rather than the average risk, which was the So the Bayes risk was um, R theta delta pi theta d theta. So that was the Bayes risk, which was, unfortunately, we had like lambda here. I forgot why we did the lambda probably is used either in your book or layman's book. Generally, you would like to have the same symbol here, the, this, the lowercase version for this, but um, it's an unfortunate situation that this is the prior, this is the density of the prior. In any case, this is the Bayes risk, and this is the so Bayes risk. This is the maximum risk. Um, and the Bayes rule minimizes this Bayes risk, the average risk, and the minimax estimator minimizes the maximum risk. OK. So the maximum risk makes sense if you're thinking of the statistics as a um, zero sum game between you, let's say, and nature. Sort of, you think of the um, um, the the um, uh, yeah. So you, you, let's say you 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 pick your estimator. So the game is like this. You um, pick delta um, nature um, picks theta. And uh, you incur the loss um, r theta delta uh, while nature wins negative r theta delta. So your whatever you lose, nature or the opposite, whoever is generating the data wins. So it's zero sum in the sense that the sum of your winnings uh, or gains is zero. So in that case, uh, you would like to, so the game, it goes like this, you, you pick first. Um, and so you know that when then nature picks theta, so nature is, let's say, give for any given delta. Uh, so you pick delta, right? Nature knows your delta is going to pick the uh, theta that maximizes this, because that's the, uh, or sorry, the, um, who should be negative. Um, so yeah, so let's call this. Uh, so you lose this, he, he gains this. So if you write it in terms of the, so the nature wins this, you lose this. Um, and so the, the, the sum of the winning sort of is zero. So because his, the nature's winning is this, he's gonna maximize his winning. So he's gonna pick a, pick, a, pick a theta that maximizes this. But you know that, so you're gonna from the start try to find delta that minimizes this worst case. So that's the rationale behind the minimax approach. Uh, it, it's taking an a, a adversarial view to, to, to the, the, uh, the way that the data is generated, which may or may not be. Generally, in practice, it's not true. So you, you don't think that 
um, your data is adversarially generated so that you incur the maximum loss. But um, that's the way that the minimax sort of approach is set up. Um, so you, you pick delta, so nature picks the theta that maximizes its winning or your loss. And so you try to guard against that by choosing delta such that this maximum risk is smallest. Does that make sense? Questions, comments? Okay, so um, the estimator that minimizes this maximum risk, I'm writing it as, as this. This is called the minimax estimator. Um, we can extend this a little bit by, uh, instead of looking at um, this over theta, we can look at the base risk and maximize over lambda. So the gain here is that, um, so generalize. Um, generalize to the case that nature picks a prior um, prior lambda and draws theta according to that prior. So this is more general than the previous setup because you can always take the prior to be a point less. Um, and so you're giving nature more freedom. So he can restrict himself to um, point masses, but he can also choose a random distribution, a distribution and randomly draw a theta that gives, uh, and then the, the, the um, his, his winning or their winning would be the expected risk versus respect to this uh, prior. And um, that potentially allows this risk to become bigger. Um, so we can work with that generalized version. Um, so if we work with this generalized problem, um, again, we still want to guard against the worst case. So we're trying to minimize this. Um, so we can observe a few things. Um, um, if I minimize this risk over um, um, so if I look at the base risk, it's going to be a function of lambda, okay? Um, and um, for, for this discussion, I'm going to refer to this R lambda as the base risk associated with lambda. So it's the minimum achievable base risk for a given um, prior. Okay, and then uh, what we'll see is that uh, what nature is trying to do is, is to pick the worst prior, basically. So lambda star is going to be least favorable prior if this base, um, um, if this base uh, risk, the optimal base risk associated with that is this, the largest um, among all priors. So if I pick a prior whose base risk, the optimal base risk is the biggest, um, then I mean, nature, if, if nature does that, uh, you can argue that uh, that's, that's the best, best choice for, for the nature. So to see this roughly, you can think of the, um, the, this chain of inequalities. So um, if I have my risk, uh, the, my um, least favorite prior, that would be uh, R of lambda star, this is the maximum over R lambda. Uh, and by definition, this is, you replace this with the definition, this is maximum over lambda, infimum over delta. Um, there is this thing called weak duality. If you have seen convex optimization, you know this, but this in general is true. This inequality is true. I can interchange the infant soup and I get an inequality in general. And this is the generalized minimax problem that we discussed. So, um, go back, this is exactly this one. Um, and so this is the infimum of the worst case uh, risk here. And so you, uh, uh, you are interested in cases where this is equal. And um, um, in that case, um, um, you would, um, 
you would be in situations where like in game theory, they say that the game has a value and it doesn't matter which, so this, this, this problem is the case where you go first and the nature goes second. This is the problem where you go, but the nature goes first and you go second and, and it doesn't matter which way you play, there's an optimal way of play for, for both. Um, and if the two sides are equal, the optimal strategy for the nature is to pick this least favorable prior. Uh, and the optimal strategy for you would be to pick the minimax uh, rule, which we're after, which we're gonna discuss. Uh, but instead of trying to uh, make this formal, uh, instead of trying to come up with conditions where this is equality, we're gonna have it result. Um, so just this was a like a detour a little bit into game theory. But um, what uh, what we have instead is we can give conditions that um, verifies this and also like uh, obtain the um, uh, minimax rule. And the conditions are are things like this. So you would um, um, you would have this result, which is a very nice result, and we're gonna prove it that. Um, uh, if you have a Bayes estimator, delta lambda, um, such that the Bayes risk for that estimator is equal to this maximum risk, um, this guy, um, sorry, the, yeah, so the, the R, R bar is just the maximum. This is just the maximum or the supremum. So you have a Bayes risk, Bayes, Bayes estimator whose um, maximum risk, which is this side, uh, is equal to um, how do we, yeah, so supreme over theta, his maximum risk is equal to his base risk. This is the base risk of this. This is equal to the uh, maximum risk. Then that uh, strategy or that estimator is minimax and that lambda is least favorable. So this is the best strategy of the nature. And furthermore, um, um, this would be unique if, if, if lambda is unique um, base, then the minimax estimator is gonna be unique uh, minimax estimator, okay? So in other words, um, instead of looking at, at all the estimators, I'm gonna look at all the base estimators because of the way that we define the problem. Um, so this part of the problem suggests that you have to look at the base estimator. So this, um, if these two are equal, uh, this is saying that this strategy is equivalent to this strategy. <clears throat> and this strategy um, is just uh, looking at the solution of this as um, the base, base rules, okay? So if, if, the, <clears throat> if this equality holds, you can say that strong, uh, it's called the strong duality. So if strong duality is, is true, then I should look at um, base rules. Um, and um, this is, this is trying to formalize that. So let's say I have a Bayes rule such that um, my Bayes risk for that estimator is equal to the maximum risk. <clears throat> then um, basically that strong duality holds in the sense that um, this is minimax, this is least favorable, and, and um, then there's also this uniqueness. So let me prove this and then ask you whether you have any questions. So <clears throat> in order to prove this, it's just, um, a few simple observations um, and then you're done. So the first observation is that the maximum risk of any estimator is always lower bounded by the average risk. So the maximum risk is always bounded below by, this is the Bayes risk. If you want, this is like P theta, D theta. So the Bayes risk of any estimator with respect to any prior is um, a lower bound on the maximum risk. Um, I'll let you argue this for yourself. It's a very um, straightforward uh, statement. So now if I have that, <clears throat> what I would do is um, I, I, I observe that um, this is less than that. This is by that inequality. This is bigger than R lambda, bigger than or equal to R lambda because um, again, this is by definition, um, this is the smallest that the Bayes risk can be. Okay, so this is <clears throat> basically R of delta, R of lambda and delta lambda. So this is 
the Bayes risk of a generic estimator. This is the Bayes risk of Bayes estimator. And this equality is by assumption. So we're, we're assuming that the Bayes risk of the um, Bayes estimator is equal to the maximum risk. And so if you look at this, uh, you observe that you've proven that the maximum risk of uh, delta lambda is bigger, sorry, smaller than the maximum risk of delta, and this holds for any delta. And so <clears throat> um, this shows that um, delta lambda has to be minimax. And then you can write another set of inequalities. I'll let you go over this for yourself. And then you can prove that um, lambda is also least favorable. So that's the one that maximizes the R lambda. And then you can argue easily that if uh, this is the, the unique base, then uh, it's going to be unique minimax. OK, so it was a little bit quick, but I'm going to stop and ask whether you have any questions. Questions, comments? Was it clear? <clears throat> so these are ideas inter are interesting. Um, I, I went over this a little bit quickly. You don't need to know about this duality, but this is basically what is going on. So if you understand a little bit of um, um, optimization, basically, there's a very nice interplay between uh, these ideas from statistics and game theory and also optimization. So the reason why you need to look at the Bayes risks, the Bayes estimators is, is coming from this strong duality argument. But this theorem doesn't require you to know about that. <clears throat> if you assume this set of conditions, basically, that there is a Bayes risk, there, there's a base estimator whose average and maximum risk are the same, then that estimator has to be minimax. Okay, questions, comments? It's either very clear or very not un unclear. Question? Well, I have a question regarding the base risk. So is the loss function of the base risk um, uh, restricted or it can be any loss for the base risk? Uh, so it's the same risk that, that we're using for, for everything. So this is, the risk, there is a loss function in there and the same loss function is used here. Um, this so result is, is, is arbitrary. Right? Sorry, this is arbitrary as long as these make sense, as long as you can find, I, I mean, there's a bit of uh, argument of the, the, it should be finite. So they expect they, these, expect these risks should be finite. Um, but um, as far as let's say there is at least one estimator whose risk is finite, you want at least the base risk to be um, um, finite. But under the, the assumption that these, these are finite, um, um, then yes, it could be arbitrary. Uh, and uh, so uh, why it is called the, the base risk? Because I, I think it's a simply a expectation. So why is it called a base risk? I guess I didn't make the connection with base. So that's how we define the base risk. So remember, there is a, um, there is a way to look at the, so this, this was the base risk that we defined. And this you can think of as the expectation of the risk um, with respect to the distribution of theta, which gives you a weighted average, or you can think of this as the expectation of this loss uh, where you have theta. So this is a really a valid uh, risk. This is the expectation of the loss, but you're taking the expectation with respect to both. So this is, um, um, it's natural to call this the Bayes risk because it's the risk defined based on the Bayesian setup. But you can write it also in this form. So that's that's what we had here. So, so what do you mean by de uh, defining <laughs> setup? So you can think of it as assuming theta to be random. So you either think of the base risk as just the weighted average of the frequentest risk, or you can think of it as this is just equal to the expectation of L theta, um, let me write it like this, theta um, delta x 
with respect to the joint distribution of theta and x, if you want. Mm -hmm. D x. So this is based because you're assuming theta is random. And so you have a joint distribution with your data. Okay, so this is not the expectation, this is the integral. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what we call, that's why we call it the base risk. I see, thank you. No problem. Okay, we can continue this discussion um, in the office.